Well, if you have a copy of God's Word or somebody around you does, let me invite you to open to Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31 will be our text this morning. So my hope for this morning is that we can be reminded of who we are in Christ as we see Paul challenging and reminding the Galatians of the truth. And within our text, Paul takes us back to an example from the Old Testament in order to make his point. So we're going to be talking a little bit about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael this morning. So we're we're almost taking a jump back into the Old Testament, but this is what Paul is referencing as he gives an example this morning. We're giving an example in this text that we'll look at for today. So hear the word of the Lord from Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born to the born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two of two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, who does not bear... Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate will be no more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman. And her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. The title of my message this morning is Children of Promise. Let's pray. Fathers, we come before you. We ask you, as we most often do when we pray, what we know not teach us. And what we are not make us. And what we have not give us. And let your Holy Spirit move in this place today, God. And if it's your will, I pray that anyone under the sound of my voice would repent of their sin and trust in you for salvation. Remove my pride from me, O oh God. And help me remember who you are and forget who I am because it's all for your glory. <coughs> Lord, thank you for the privilege of preaching your word. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first of four points that I have for this morning, and they're all going to start with the the same three words. They'll make it kind of easy for you. So children of promise will be the first three words for each point. So the first point that I have is children of promise are not under the law. Children of promise are not under the law. And this is dealing with verse 21. So a recurring theme that we have seen all throughout this series is that Christians are not people who are under the law. And there are many ways to describe God's people. And in this text, Paul is calling them children of promise. Paul asked the Galatians in verse 21 to actually listen to the law. They have let themselves become so convinced by the Judaizers that they need to add a works-based performance in order for them to be acceptable before God. We are acceptable before God, not based on anything that we ever have done or will do. We are acceptable before God because of the work that Jesus has done for us. When God looks at us, he loves us because we are his children. And I've got to tell you, I've never met a single parent who, when their child was born, and they looked at them for the first time, that they didn't see love. They always look on them with love. That kind of love that we have as children of promise isn't a love that comes from being enslaved to the law. So yes, there is purpose in the law. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. It makes us, reminds us of our sin. It reminds us that we are depraved and sinful people. 
But Jesus has already fulfilled the law. So Christians are not people who live under the law. We are people who live under Christ. And listen to the way Charles Spurgeon puts it when he says, What is God's law now? It is not above a Christian. It is under a Christian. Some men hold God's law like a rod in terrarium over Christians and say, If you sin, you will be punished with it. It is not so. The law is under a Christian. It is for him to walk on, to be his guide, his rule, his pattern. Law is the road which guides us, not the rod which drives us, nor the spirit which actuates us. All that to emphasize emphasize the main point of children of promise are not under the law. So now to the question Paul is asking in verse 21. The point he's trying to make is, is that if the Galatians truly look at the law, then they would know that the law contradicts them. Let's also remember this. Paul knows this practice of works-based righteousness very well. He was very much a Jewish man in his upbringing and was devoted to upholding and keeping the law because he thought that that was God's will for his life. Anyone else who was not doing as he was doing was an unrighteous person. He persecuted and he ravaged the church because he believed strongly in the cause of keeping the law. And he was taking out those who he felt were not doing the will of God by keeping the law. But God in his sovereignty got a hold of Paul's life and he saved him. And then Paul realized the truth that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the reason I bring up a snapshot of Paul's life before Christ and after his conversion is to show that he knows what he's talking about when he's challenging the Galatians with this question. He's got experience in this way, so that's why he's able to address them as he's doing here. He wants them to know uh, that if they really want to take the law, what the law says literally... And, you know, it's amazing, not even here, but it's amazing just in general, how so many people can be deceived when a message is taken, it's twisted, and appealing things are added to it to make it sound more desirable. But do not be deceived. Children of promise are not under the law. And Paul then takes them through a quick Bible study. And maybe through a quick Sunday school lesson, if you would, in that, in that day. As he uses an Old Testament story as an example to prove his point. And this brings me to my second main point this morning. <clears throat> Children of promise are of the free woman. Children of promise are of the free woman. Let's read verses 22 and 23 again. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. While the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. One thing they talked about, we've talked about in a recent sermon is how the Judaizers thought of themselves as sons of Abraham because they were the worthy, worthy of the offspring, of, sorry, of the blessing that were promised to Abraham's offspring. And it is true that they were children of Abraham because Paul says that they are. But as David Guzik points out, They forget that Abraham had two sons. Not just one son, two sons. And the two sons came from two different women. Ishmael was by Hagar, the slave woman that we read about here in the text. And Isaac came from the free woman, who we also read about here in our text. And Sarah was Abraham's wife, and for many years she was barren, which means that she was not able to have children. But the Lord made a promise to Sarah that she would one day give birth to a son. And as we know with God, he always comes through on his promises. We need to make sure that we understand the difference between the two children. So let's read verse 23 again. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. You see, even after God had made this promise to Sarah, Abraham dealt with unbelief as to how it would happen. So Abraham, being the imperfect man that he was, acted according to his flesh. He did not trust God to come through on his promise. And he thought in order to have an heir of his take salvation to the world, 
that he needed an alternative route to do that. He's like, I've got a wife who's barren. I've got to be able to make this line continue or else God's promise is not going to be able to be fulfilled. Abraham and Sarah thought this is what they needed to do in order to keep the family line going. And they chose Hagar to do this. And this is a clear example of what happens when we try to take matters into our own hands instead of trusting God to come through on his promises. We are many times a people who want instant confirmation, and we are not willing to wait on God. When you're driving somewhere and you know that it's going to take a long time, what do you do? If you're like me, then you look for alternate routes on the GPS in order a way to find a place to get to the destination faster. If we're not careful, we can do the same thing when it comes to waiting on the Lord. We, when we try to take matters into our own hands, we end up trying to do work to achieve God's promise instead of placing our trust in Him that He is going to come through. God is a God who comes through. We have to be patient and know that God's timing is perfect. Abraham had this struggle and it caused him to act according to his flesh. And Tim Keller gives great insight into this when he says, Abraham decided not to wait on God's supernatural actions to get his son. Instead, he waited, he, sorry, instead he decided to get his son through human attainment, through what he was capable of, and through what Hagar was capable of. Then Ishmael was born by way of Hagar, the slave woman. And of course, like he always does, God came through on his promise, and Sarah, the free woman, bore a son named Isaac. As we already know, Sarah was barren and was unable to conceive. The fact that she was able to give birth to Isaac is a true miracle. It is a miracle that is only possible because of the miraculous work of God. And Isaac being born to Sarah is an example of something that only God can do. Ishmael came by way of the flesh, which entailed self-effort and a works-based righteousness. But the way Isaac came through was God coming through on his promise. That's the way Isaac came, was God came through on his promise. And Paul is using this example from Genesis in order to make his point to the Galatians. So what do Ishmael and Isaac represent? Why is Hagar called the slave woman? And why is Sarah called the free woman? And how does any of this tie into what Paul is talking about here in Galatians? Well, I'm glad you asked those questions because that brings me to my third main point this morning. Children of promise, figurative meaning. Children of promise, figurative meaning. The reason Paul is using this Old Testament example is for the purpose of allegory, which illustrates his point. And John MacArthur says, The two mothers, Hagar and Sarah, and the two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, lucidly and graphically represent two covenants. Hagar and Ishmael represent the covenant of law and works, and Sarah and Isaac represent the covenant of grace and faith. Now knowing this, let's read verse 24 through 27. Again, so where you're in the context of. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be no more than those of one who has a husband. So Paul is using this example that he wants for the Galatians to know that they correspond with Hagar because they are the ones that are falling victim to the false teachers who are enslaved to the law. When Abraham slept with Hagar, he was trying to do the work himself of continuing the family line. That was counterproductive because it did not line up with what God had already promised to he and Sarah. By doing this, he placed his faith 
in himself in order to, to do the work. And he did not trust in God to do the work. There's many ways, even in our day, to where when we want to get something done, we try to expedite the process. Abraham tried to expedite this process. But it wasn't according to God's will that it should be that way because it wasn't a part of God's promise. So he tried to expedite it so that he could continue the family line. So just as we saw a moment ago, this allegory or illustration of the gospel that we see here is that Ishmael represents salvation by works and Isaac represents salvation by grace. And that's exactly the point that Paul is trying to get across to the Galatians that salvation is found in Jesus. Salvation is not found by keeping the law. You see, the Judaizers were part of the old covenant, which was given to Moses at Mount Sinai when he received the law. And they are part of present Jerusalem. And those who are in Christ are part of the new covenant that God has promised, which was fulfilled in Jesus. And those who believe in Christ belong to heavenly Jerusalem. And just like we talked about last week, Paul is pleading and he is begging for the Galatians to not turn back to the ways of the law. And he is reminding them that it is something that we need to be reminded of too. Which is right standing before God is not hinging on our performance. It doesn't hinge on anything that we do. It should fill us with great peace knowing that. Knowing the fact that what we do today, what we do tomorrow, what we did yesterday, what we're going to do next week. Our performance is not hinging on, on our right standing before God of how we're seen as acceptable. Jesus is the one who is good for us. And he is good in us. He is our salvation. He is our peace. He is our joy. And once again, I love what Tim Keller points out of the story when he says, The gospel is that we do not try to attain a righteousness that our abilities can develop. Rather, we are to receive a righteousness provided through supernatural acts of God in history. The miraculous birth, sin-bearing death, and death-defeating resurrection of Christ. But Paul points out something else when he quotes Isaiah 54, 1 in verse 27 when he says, Rejoice, O barren, for who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate... <clears throat> One will be more than those of the one who has a husband. And for much of her life, Sarah was barren. But God made her a promise that she would, he would bring a son to she and Abraham to keep the family line going. He's made this promise, and of course, he came through on it, just like he always does. Christians are called sons of Abraham because we come from the lineage of believers who trace all the way back to him. Sons of Abraham are those who live lives committed to the mission of God. And Paul is reminding the Galatians here that they, along with Paul, are children of promise. But if you're here today, but if you're not a children of promise, then you can become one today by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus for salvation. There's not any work that you have to do to achieve acceptance before God because Jesus has already finished that work for us at the cross. Now when you have Jesus, you have the power of his Holy Spirit living inside of you. And 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, now the, Spirit, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We've talked about this many times before. The gift of the Holy Spirit, God gives us. In fact, let's just turn back to Romans 8 real quick. Romans 8. It talks about the gift of the Spirit and how He intercedes for us. Romans 8. 25 and 26. That if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. <clears throat> Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
I'm so glad he intercedes for us. And we have the spirit of God living in us. And just like it said there in 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Main point number four. Children of promise have freedom. Children of promise have freedom. And the last of what Paul gives here is in the text is a personal application. Let's read verses 28 through 31. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. And he reminds them that they are children of promise through what God has miraculously done, but not by their own effort. His grace is truly amazing. And if you are in him, then you have experienced this grace firsthand. And Paul keeps the contrast going by pointing out how Ishmael and his descendants were born of the flesh, persecuted Isaac, and his descendants who were children of promise. And Paul ties this together with how the Galatians are treated by the Judaizers. And history is repeating, himself, repeating itself as Ishmael, who saw himself as a descendant of Abraham, which he was, thought of himself <clears throat> as the descendant of Abraham and not Isaac. The Judaizers are doing the very same thing when they're telling the Galatians, you need to become Jewish in order for you to be acceptable before God. But verse 30 is very important when Paul says, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Back in Genesis 21, if you remember that, Sarah told Abraham to cast out Hagar and Ishmael. Which was followed up by God telling Abraham, do as she tells you to, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And Paul is essentially telling the Galatians that they need to cast out anyone who is enslaved to the law. And anyone who lives a religious life associated with a works-based performance does not line up with the gospel of grace and peace. John MacArthur nails it when he says, Those who hold to salvation by works, trusting in their own performance of the law, hate those who proclaim salvation without, by grace without works. And there is no possible way for us to free ourselves of the chains that sin holds us in. Our works do not produce righteousness within us. The only way righteousness comes is when God decides to give us the gift of grace and we trust in him. When he frees us from slavery, we are immediately brought into freedom. As children of promise, we have freedom. And let's understand something about freedom. Christ has not given us the freedom to live whatever way he wants us to, sorry, he has not given us the freedom to live whatever way that we want to live. He has given us the freedom to live for him. Grace is a freedom from sin. Grace is not a freedom to sin. And the Christian life is a process of sanctification, which is where we are becoming more holy and we are becoming more like Jesus each day. It's going to come with its bumps and its bruises. It's going to be hard. But sanctification is a marathon, not a sprint. If you are in Christ, then you are a child of promise. And as a child of promise, you are no longer under the law, but under Christ. And as a child of promise, you have freedom because of what Jesus has done. Rest in that today. But if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you have always had the head knowledge, but you truly have not had the heart change, then I would implore you to surrender your life to him today. When you have Jesus, you have everything because he is everything. Let's pray.